Welcome to the 2021 Ardenwood Annual Meeting coming to you from San Francisco, California under cobalt blue skies. I'm John Mitchell and I serve as Executive Director and CEO. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Over 1400 dear friends have registered. Though many miles separate us physically, we are as we read in the book of Acts, all with one accord in one place. We're together in spirit, fully present right here and now. So just for fun, let's imagine all of us together in our beautiful Ardenwood Chapel. Wouldn't it be fun to see that? As to today's program, we have several progress reports to share, along with some good news, a short video, beautiful music, and Madeline Maupin's talk. So let's get started. We'll begin with a prayer, actually with the Lord's Prayer, sung by a very special musician, Josh Hen, one of the soloists for the Mother Church. Beautiful, Josh. My goodness, thank you for sharing your golden voice with us today. And thank you, Rose Whitmore, for accompanying him. The Bible's golden thread of healing, God's presence. That's the title of Helen Maupin's talk and theme of our reports today. There are some wonderful examples of this golden thread weaving a tapestry of healing here at Arden Wood this past year. As you well know, the human scene has tried valiantly to disrupt, to derail, and mostly definitely discourage the entire world. But for all its extensive effort, it has failed to halt spiritual growth and innovative activity. And aren't these two key elements of healing? 
In our textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy, we read, in order to apprehend more, we must put into practice what we already know. We must recollect the truth that we must recollect that truth is demonstrable when understood and that good is not understood until demonstrated. The golden thread is the continuous revealing of good, no matter what the human circumstances claim to be. Let me share a story. One year ago today, we held our very first online only annual meeting. We refused to give in to the temptation to postpone or cancel this important event. And so on the wings of inspiration and with little Zoom experience, we catapulted Ardenwood into a brand new arena and discovered God's ever presence in a completely new way. And what an adventure it's been. Since last May, we have hosted 10 webinars and serve between 300 and 1100 participants each time and many hundreds more through the replays available on our website. Today marks our 11th webinar. We hope you and you are the largest audience to date. We are so grateful. Now, as we begin to slowly reopen our doors, we are already planning hybrid events for both in-person and online participants so that no one is left out. Through this new outreach style, we have also discovered how much you appreciate learning about wise practical footsteps to keep your financial affairs and healthcare plans up to date and in good order. We are delighted to help educate and to support the field in these ways. To us, it's an example of Ardenwood showing proof of its utility. Here's another story. Our visiting Christian Science Nursing Service has been actively engaged with patients through friendly calls over the phone, FaceTime, Skype, and Zoom. Would you, could you ever have imagined receiving care in any other way than in person? Some of you have likely been recipients of this care, of a friendly call to hear how you're doing, to read the Bible lesson with you, to explain how to use a mobility aid or to clean a wound. Above all, each call is simply an expression of God's ever presence, especially when you might feel very much alone. We would not have discovered this new form of visiting care had we not been required to shelter in place. As a side note, some of our patients and sheltered care guests haven't been able to be with loved ones in over one year. Think of that. No one could have anticipated that, yet together, we have carried on with joy, calm, and courage. We have all surely grown in our understanding of ceaseless good. One last story. This one is about what's been happening inside our building while the outside has been locked out. Our residents have given new meaning to the word active spiritually, physically, and communally. One resident has been our regular pianist for innumerable hymn sings and testimony meetings. Another is a tireless gardener, weeding, planting and watering, growing vegetables for our kitchen and creating delightful bouquets in our dining room tables, for our dining room tables. And several residents have become regular readers for our Wednesday testimony meetings. Most of our residents visited with family and loved ones over Zoom on Thanksgiving and Christmas day. It was very touching to see their amazement and joy at being together from all corners of the world, literally. Last and perhaps most important, all of our residents are devoted metaphysicians, supporting Arden Wood, our community, and our world through their daily study and prayers. They make Arden Wood sing. In other news, our staff has been thinking deeply this year about the quality of our services and what Ardenwood is truly called to do. For instance, how can Ardenwood prepare to welcome and embrace younger generations of Christian scientists? I suspect many of you have given, have taken similar deep dives into your own lives with a similar goal to decide what really matters and what to let go of. It's always about aligning with God, isn't it? With life, love, principle, 
and it's not always easy, but we are finding the process to be refreshing and healing. And I expect you are too. In her message to the Mother Church for 1902, Mary Baker Eddy captures the way we most want Arden Wood to show up in the world. She writes, to live and let live without clamor for distinction or recognition, to wait on divine love, to write truth first on the tablet of one's own heart. This is the sanity and perfection of living and my human ideal. Ardenwood is an idea that emanates from God and serves our fellow man. We are deeply grateful to each of you for standing with us in support of healing and Christly service. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Pat Barrett, the president of the Ardenwood Board of Trustees. Pat? Hello. I am delighted to be greeting you from inside Ardenwood. San Francisco regulations have kept Arden Wood closed to visitors for over a year now, and now is able to begin reopening to a few from the outside. My visit has allowed me to taste the superb quality of the food from our new vendor. So when you can visit, I encourage you to enjoy a meal in our dining room. As far as coming to Arden Wood, please check our website for the latest reopening news. Until further notice, we request that you call the front desk to schedule a visit at least 24 hours ahead. This is in order to comply with San Francisco regulations, which are more restrictive for facilities like Arden Wood than for the general public. We are grateful for your patience and are eager to welcome everyone with open arms, but that won't be for a while yet. Now, let me tell you about a few golden threads of this past year. Hiring Epicurean Group to be our food service vendor is one of them. What a difference it's made in the quality of the food and service, meaning the meals are farm fresh, to farm to table fresh, the cooks are superb, and the servers are well-trained and personable. As we all know, meals are meaningful and bring everyone together. We are quite happy with the Epicurean team. One of the most important achievements this past year is a compensation goal we've been working towards for several years. All Arden Wood employees are now earning 100% of their job value in accordance with a compensation study conducted by a highly respected firm, Arthur J. Gallagher and Company. We've also enhanced and added to our employee benefits, all without overextending our annual operating budget. We're so grateful for the dedication of our staff especially through this extraordinary year. Another golden thread is that all of our care and residential services have continued to operate without interruption, thanks primarily to the exceptional commitment of our Christian science nurses. Many have worked double shifts and several are serving in other Christian science care facilities in addition to working full-time for Arden Wood, always in compliance with COVID mandates. Most of them have not had any vacation for more than a year, and we are just now able to schedule time off for some of them to travel to be with their families in other countries. The last golden thread I'll mention is Christian Science Nurses Training. Skilled Christian Science Nurses form the core of all our Christian Science Nursing Services. For the past year, we have been challenged to accept all the patients who have called for care due to a lack of trained staff. Finally, in January, we were able to hold an introductory Christian Science Nursing Arts class for three trainees from Principia College. You'll meet our instructor, 
Vanessa Campbell, over video later this meeting. Christian science nurses are in high demand all over the United States, and we are eager to focus more attention on training in the months ahead. And now, I'd like to turn the focus away from us to you, our donors and friends. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the senior leadership team, I want to thank you for your contributions to the remarkable year we've been through together. You have attended our online events by the hundreds, which has been music to our ears and hopefully to yours as well. As a nonprofit charitable 501c3 organization, Arden Wood will always reap the blessings of donor participation and we treasure every gift. I am pleased to report that our finances are in good order. What's more, we are committed to seeking and finding more sustainable ways to provide the quality care we are known for. The idea that we call Ardenwood will change with the times, but its mission to support Christian science healing is timeless. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Now I have some good news to share. After five years of outstanding service to Arden Wood, our Director of Residential Programs, Diane Spear, retired at the end of March. We miss her, but we fully support her next steps as well as Arden Wood's next steps. Always forward, always unfolding good. And so we are pleased to tell you that Stephanie Boyman will be joining our Ardenwood family as the Director of Residential Programs beginning June 15th. Stephanie has been at the Principia School in St. Louis for several years and at Peace Haven, our sister facility before that. She brings wonderful experience and fresh perspective. We are really looking forward to Steph's arrival in mid-June. Please feel free to call her then about joining our residential community. Right now, I have the pleasure of introducing Prudence Carr, who joined our residential family in 2019. Prue is a journalisted Christian science practitioner and continues her practice right here. Prudence? Hello. If there's one thing I hope you leave this talk knowing, it's that everyone's experience as a resident or a patient here will be different, but Ardenwood will honor it, respect it, and support your individual progress. Three years ago, I was at home when a serious disability took over my body. I refused to give it place. I knew that good being real, its opposite is necessarily unreal. I did not have to accept this impairment. I was healed on the fourth day. My five adult children live across the world with very full lives. And my youngest urged me to visit and decide on a future place of my choice for skilled care, should I need it. Shortly thereafter, I visited Ardenwood on, as a come and see guest. And three months later, I moved into a lovely small apartment. What was I looking for? Of course, Christian Science nursing availability. I wanted a residential community of committed Christian scientists. I hoped there would be com technical computer support for the unfoldment of my Christian Science public practice of healing. And I did, must admit, I did want freedom from shopping for food, cooking, cleaning, yard care, and driving. I wanted opportunities to serve as Jesus did and to live as Mary Baker Eddy did. At Ardenwood, I found an atmosphere of love, respect, and inclusivity. I did go through a period of adapting and adjusting to a different environment after living alone for the seven previous years. 
I found mature Christian scientists. I even had editing help when writing for the Christian science publications. Here, there is unlimited opportunity to serve at Ardenwood or nearby at our local Christian Science Church, where I do serve as Sunday school teacher, as an executive board member, and I'm a corresponding chaplain for the prisons. That's a very rewarding endeavor and fruitful. And I, my main priority every day is to focus on study and daily metaphysical prayer for healing at Ardenwood with my clients in church and in our local community and the nation and the world. When I considered what to share with you today, I realized I'm developing a more Christly character just by being part of this Ardenwood family. A growing understanding of spiritual reality an enlarged faith and trust in Father, Mother, God to express life as me in new endeavors. I have had a, an ongoing movement towards simplicity in my life. I have a refined interaction with residents and staff. I've been learning patience to exchange the false waymark of personality for the perfect man of God's creation to see only good in place of imperfection. And I have an enlarged confidence to give financially and spiritually, and that feels really good, to the cause of Christ's Christianity. Here there are added blessings. Here at Ardenwood, I find quiet, and it's easy to feel God's presence. Beauty and order are everywhere I look, especially in individuals who live and work here. Here there are infinite spiritual resources. And daily, I have enlarged motivation to love more with healing love and to do some good to thine for thee. In closing, I wish to express my gratitude to God, to Christ Jesus, and to Mary Baker Eddy, and to everyone here at Ardenwood. I can think of no arena during this season of my human experience that would be better suited for me to exchange the objects of sense for the ideas of soul, as Mrs. Eddy tells us in her textbook. I am happy here. Thank you, Prue. We love having you as a resident, especially a happy one, truly. And now I have another announcement to share. After 15 years as the director of Christian Science Nursing Services, including, including being the director of Christian Science Nurses Training for the last 18 months, Leslie DeFrisco is now going to devote her full attention to training. We couldn't be more grateful to Leslie for all that she has done and for all that she will do to strengthen our Christian Science Nursing Arts training program going forward. Christian Science nurses are needed both here and throughout the field, and Arden Wood is eager to help train and to supply them. Another wonderful unfoldment is that Labeche Odenyi, who trained here at Arden Wood and who has been serving as Assistant Director of Christian Science Nursing, is stepping into the director's role. We are deeply grateful for the grace, skill, heart, and professionalism of both Lebeche and Leslie as Ardenwood moves forward to meet current needs. So now we're looking for an assistant director of Christian Science Nursing, as well as mentors. You can apply and find other job openings here at Ardenwood on our website, ardenwood.org. And now, Leslie will report on our Christian Science Nursing Services and introduce a brand new video. Leslie, bring us up to date. Hello. You know, we're often asked, what makes Ardenwood different from a medical care facility? That's a fair question. Ardenwood offers the world a healing environment that accepts no limitations, no dis-eased thought 
no interruption to, quote, the rhythmic round of unfolding bliss as living witnesses to and perpetual ideas of inexhaustible good, end quote. That phrase is from a passage in Miscellaneous Writings by Mary Baker Eddy. Beautiful, isn't it? Several weeks ago, I had a conversation with an EMT who was transporting a patient by ambulance. As he entered the building, he asked me, so nobody here takes any medication? I replied, that's correct. Then I added, and our facility is COVID free. To which he said, really? How do you do it? I told him, we pray, we are law abiding, and we are wise. Then I added, none of our patients, residents, or Christian Science nursing staff have had COVID. In disbelief, he said, ever? I confirmed, never. He then confirmed that was not at all the case in most facilities. His team watched the skillful way we assisted in transferring the patient and asked several questions about Christian science and Christian science nursing. We love these conversations. They remind us of how important Arden Wood's healing message, healing mission is. Perhaps you're wondering what's been going on here during this unusual time. While we've all been staying close to home, we're finding new ways to connect and communicate with others. Also, as John noted, we've held several webinars on Medicare and health insurance to eliminate any fears or obstacles that might try to keep someone from calling on Christian Science Nursing if there is a need for support. And now that we're beginning to see the light at the end of this pandemic tunnel, we're grateful to finally be able to host in-person visits, although mostly outdoors. Progress. Last November, the Commission for Accreditation of Christian Science Nursing Facilities slash organizations did a comprehensive review of Arden Wood over the internet. We uploaded hundreds of pages of documents in a secure manner, and then the review team interviewed staff on Zoom. It was quite an involved process that took place over several days. We're grateful to report that a three-year accreditation has been renewed for our Christian Science Nursing, Christian Science Visiting Nurse Service, and Christian Science Nurses Training Program. This spring, we've been looking at our Christian Science Nursing Services with fresh eyes to more clearly define our ministry, as well as the patient's eligibility to be in each program area of Arden Wood. We are looking and listening for ways to more effectively support healing and progress in all areas. We are moving some patients to new rooms, adding new program equipment and repurposing some spaces. Our guiding principle is that Arden Wood is a place to be refreshed, restored, renewed, and to live with dominion and grace. Our expectation is always quick and whole healing. We have a dedicated staff of Christian Science nurses who have been fully and faithfully engaged in their ministries right here, caring for our patients, sheltered care guests, and residents. We couldn't be more grateful for their commitment to healing and to Arden Wood. Now, I have a question for you. Has this past year caused you to rethink your job or your career interest? If it has, Explore Christian Science Nursing. It's a unique and rewarding ministry that will unite your love of Christian science and your desire to help your fellow man. We are preparing to teach another introductory Christian Science Nursing Arts class in July, and we're still accepting applications. So if you're interested or have questions, please be in touch. And now, I'd like to share some examples of the golden thread of healing here at Arden Wood. A patient was presented with the claim of stroke and found herself in the hospital. Family members who were not Christian scientists knew the hospital would not have been her choice for care and worked diligently to have her transferred to Arden Wood. But at that time, Arden Wood was full 
So the visiting Christian science nurse made several visits while she was still in the hospital. When we were able to admit her, she spent several weeks on the Christian science nursing floor before progressing to sheltered care. She continued to express more independence. Her family made arrangements for her to return home with modest support system in place, including a meal delivery service and a weekly visit from the visiting Christian science nurse. She looks forward to these visits and is doing very well at home. Several months ago, one of our residents tripped and fell, injuring her hip. The decision was made to go to the ER for x-rays, which determined that her hip was broken. After a few days in the hospital, she was discharged to a skilled nursing facility. Two days later, she was finally able to transfer to Ardenwood, where she made a quick recovery. She was up and walking with the support of Christian Science nurses and soon was zipping down the hall with a walker and a smile. Before returning to her apartment, we asked her to do a test run of walking down to the main dining room. As we entered, all heads turned and the room broke into applause. Tears ran down her cheeks as she felt their love and support. She has returned to her Ardenwood apartment with joy and gratitude. And now I'd like to read a special gratitude letter that we received this past year. Dear Christian Science Nurses, my mom has loved and supported the healing mission of Ardenwood for as long as I can remember. She volunteered from time to time, reading the Bible lessons to patients. She has witnessed many healings of her own patients who were under your care. And she even benefited from much needed weekend rest and study retreats over the years. But I don't think any of us, my mom included, truly appreciated fully what you dear sweet people really do and how well you do it until my mom required your nursing care herself. She already knew there was nowhere else she could have received the professional, practical, gentle care you all provided. And she already knew you would back her demonstration without interference or anxious concern, and that you would shield her mentally and physically from such errors. But one thing I don't think she expected was the depth of your heartfelt love toward her. You treated her like she was your own mother, and I cannot tell you enough how much she loved and still loves you all for that. You probably already know that you had the privilege of helping a genuine Christian warrior. Thank you from a grateful son. We are perpetually engaged in expecting and witnessing inexhaustible good. Calls come in every week from all over the country requesting admission for care. Most Christian science care facilities are at capacity at this time. A healing haven like Ardenwood, as well as skillful Christian science nurses are essential to an individual's freedom to practice Christian science today. Thank you for your loving support of this vital work. And now you'll have a chance to hear from Vanessa Campbell, one of our Christian science nursing arts instructors. She will share her experience and perspective on becoming a Christian science nurse. Hi, I'm Vanessa Campbell, and I'm talking to you today from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Have you ever considered a career in Christian science nursing? You might have just graduated from college and you're looking for the next thing, or perhaps you've had a career, maybe even raised a family, and you're searching for something new. Either way, you might be a great candidate for Christian science nursing. When I was a young adult, at some point, I couldn't find what I was supposed to do with my life and what inspired me. And at that point, someone who was close to me suggested that I think about what it was that I love to do the most. And when I really thought about it, it was metaphysical thinking, living Christian science, being with people and expressing qualities like cheer, 
patience, humor, and tenderness. And this friend suggested that I take Christian Science Nurses training at Ardenwood in San Francisco. I didn't even really know what that was, but I was searching and I went to find out. That was 20 years ago. And every day since then, I have been so grateful to have been led to such inspiring and fulfilling work. Everyone's journey to this gem of a ministry is unique. It's a career that's joyous, creative, and deeply satisfying. The glimpse that I had of how divinely inspired Christian Science Nursing is has truly led me to a lifelong love of it. One of the first impressions that I had of Christian Science Nurses is how delightful, spiritually minded, and thoughtful they are. Their hearts beat for others, they're oh so selfless, and very practical. <laughs> The Christian Science nurses that I've had the privilege of working with truly are some of the most wonderful people you will ever meet. They bring comfort and cheer into the sick room on their wings, and they truly do have wings. The ministry of Christian Science Nursing is an incredible journey of faith, discovery, and trust in God's power, presence, and care. It's that willingness to work for God and let God do the work. To say, here I am, I am yours, I'm completely in your service. I will see your children as you see them. Nurture, care, and support them until they're whole and free. The Christian Science Nurse can be an essential support to while the Christian Science Practitioner is praying for the patient. So to have the loving, practical care and spiritual mindedness of a Christian science nurse really supports that healing of the practitioner's work. So here are some questions that you might ask yourself if you're considering Christian science nursing. Do you love God as much as dearly as you love your own family? Would you like to put Christian science into practice every single day? Do you naturally feel impelled to reach out and care for others? Would you like to see the world the way Jesus saw it, to behold the perfect man, no matter what the material picture presents? And do you love church and live it with all your heart? If you have answered yes five times, then Christian Science Nursing might be for you. Ardenwood is offering an introductory Christian Science Nursing Arts One class in July of 2021. We would love for you to come live in the metropolitan city of San Francisco and to be a part of that class. Consider applying. The training program at Ardenwood is a paid internship with on-site housing and the program prepares you for an array of settings such as Christian Science camps, Christian Science schools, visiting Christian Science Nurse Services, Christian Science Facilities, and private duty settings. Lastly, I'd just love to say that in all the years of experience I've had supporting members of the Mother Church, it's always the greatest privilege to work alongside such dedicated individuals of all backgrounds, cultures, ages, who come and choose to serve in this field. It's inspiring to witness healing, to make a difference in others' lives, and to grow spiritually in your practice of Christian science. You truly get to be a disciple of Christ Jesus in this work. So please, consider coming to beautiful San Francisco and apply today. Thank you, Leslie and Vanessa. You know, I was at our front desk when Vanessa walked through Ardenwood's front door. <laughs> that first day she referred to 20 years ago. Sorry, it just touches me. In 2001, she's a ray of pure sunshine. Vanessa's video will be available on our website. So please feel free to share it with anyone who, who, who might be interested in Christian science nursing. You know, you're the best advertisers of what it means to be cared for by a Christian science nurse. So we hope you'll share your stories with others. 
This will conclude the business section of our meeting today. Next, we have another musical treat for you. Josh Hen will sing hymn 175, Lo, He Sent His Word and Healed Them by Violet Hay. Josh and Brian Ashley, pianist and organist for the Mother Church, did this recording for us just a few days ago. Thank you both. Following the hymn, we'll take a five minute break before Madeline Maupin gives, gives her talk. A countdown slide will tell you when we'll start up again. We'll see you shortly. introduce Maddie, I'd like to remind us all, including myself, that the mission of any Christian Science Care Facility is to support the healing ministry of Christian Science Nursing and Nurses. And the purpose of a Christian Science Nurse is to support, contribute to, and expect, expect and witness quick and whole healing. I have been a patient here at Ardenwood twice and can attest firsthand to this vital ministry. With this in mind, I urge you not to wait or hesitate to call a Christian Science practitioner and to come to Ardenwood for care if you have a need. We are ready to serve and together to expect and witness healing. And now, I suspect just about everyone here today knows Maddie and loves her Bible talks. Just the same, I'll share a bit of her background first. Originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Madeline Maupin graduated from Principia College with a BA in Biblical Studies and later earned a Master's of Theological Studies with a focus on Biblical Studies from the San Francisco Theological Seminary. She was the National Advertising Manager for the Christian Science Monitor and publisher for both the San Jose and the San Francisco Business Journals. 
For 20 years, Madeline had, has had a leadership consulting firm in Los Angeles, working with major entertainment and high-tech companies around the world. And for five years, she served as cultural historian lecturer for Princess Cruises on their trips to the Middle East and Bible lands. In 2012, Maddie started Bible Roads, a biblical education company for spiritual seekers, regardless of their church or non-church backgrounds. Bible Roads provides Bible talks, CDs, workbooks, and video courses for individual or group study. A recently added membership series provides live monthly webinars on biblical topics. This year's series is called A Virtual Tour of Israel. Madeline was a camper, counselor, and trustee at Adventure Unlimited in Buena Vista, Buena Vista that's how they say it, Buena Vista, Colorado. She served on the Mother Church National Ecumenical Team for eight years, and she has many, written many articles for the Christian Science Sentinel and Journal, as well as done daily lifts and Sentinel podcasts. She currently serves as second reader for the First Church of Christ Scientist in Newport Beach, where she lives. It is my pleasure to welcome Madeline Maupin today. Maddie? Hello, and thank you, John. It is such a joy to be with you and everyone on this call today. We gather today at this annual meeting of Ardenwood to celebrate one more year of Ardenwood's commitment to Christian healing. As much as any time in the institution's 90 year history, its example has never been more needed. Speaking for all of us here and around the world who treasure Christian science nursing and its ministry, as well as training the next generation of Christian science nurses, a huge thank you to Arden Wood for how faithfully and richly you are fulfilling your mission. From many standpoints, particularly health, this past year has been one of the toughest in a century dealing with the effects of a global pandemic unlike anything we've seen since the era of World War I. But as students of Christian science, we have our pastor, the Bible, and the means to unlock its spiritual meaning, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. And these two books give us so much to deal with the fears with which the world is grappling. Now, I grew up in the newspaper business, so forgive me, but I'm used to trying to summarize everything in the first paragraph. So here's a sentence that I think captures the essence of what I'm trying to say in the next hour. The claims of a virus is that it is everywhere and dangerous but it is the divine ever-presence, God good, that is instead always with us, overturning any other claim. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Here are two brief statements to ponder as we consider our theme, the Bible's golden thread of healing, God's presence. And both of these you'll recognize are from Science and Health. The first is, the greatest wrong is but a supposititious opposite of the highest right. And the second, the rule of inversion infers from error its opposite, truth. Now, I'm going to just be quiet and let you stare at the slide for a moment. These are two very thoughtful statements that require our, our good thinking. So just read those to yourselves for a moment. From these, we see that error claims to have the same attributes of God, claims to mimic God, claims to provide real and often frightening counterfeits to God good. Applying the rule of inversion, which Mrs. Eddy talks about, we can identify these spurious assertions 
as false claims to God's omnipresence, God's omnipotence, and God's omniaction. Aren't these the very claims by health officials about this virus? And not just the virus, but the economic conditions that have been the fallout of essentially a year of sheltering in place. And this is why the Bible is so important. It provides over 2,000 years of examples of spurious claims and counterfeits being overturned, being seen through, face down, canceled, proved powerless. So we're going to take a little stroll, actually more like a marathon dash, through some of the Bible's stories to see how the ever presence of God, of spirit, truth, and love has always been there when turned to, and is still there for us when we turn to it. And my goal is not to go in depth on Bible accounts you already know, and I'm sure treasure, but to remind us of all the unbroken line of light that is God's healing presence. And because this is such a big topic, we'll focus on just three points. But before we do that, I'd like to tell you a story. A few years ago, my husband and I visited the San Diego Wild Animal Park, which was recently renamed to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Different from the very famous and wonderful San Diego Zoo, this is a species re rehabilitation site, among other activities, with hundreds of acres where animals that are on the verge of distinction are sent to repopulate. We got on the tram that takes you around the park, and um, it does that without disturbing the animals, and we were thrilled when the guide got to the giraffe area and was so excited because he knew the mother giraffe was just about to give birth and he wanted to see if she had. Hallelujah, she did. And the little one was literally born within the hour just before we came by. We were in awe watching her mother and dad lick her, clean her, wash her up and get her ready for her new adventure called life. But we were stunned when the guide proceeded to tell us Giraffes give birth standing up. That little one took a six foot drop in order that the umbilical cord could be dropped. Wow. So that leads me to the three points we're going to cover today. The first is that God, our father, mother, is always here to nurture and care for us with infinite tenderness like those giraffe parents did for that little one. The second point is that the jarring moments in our lives are often how we actually find our life, find true life, just like that baby giraffe found hers. And the third point is that the Bible is filled with dozens of examples, if not hundreds, of people who learned these two things. And that's a good thing in case we forget these two lessons in our own life experience. Point one, our father mother is always there to care and nurture us. That's a pretty bold claim. It reminds me of the conviction of a little boy who was asked by a very skeptical friend, where is God? And as the doubting friend named numerous locations here behind that mountain over there on the street, the little boy kept answering unblinkingly, absolutely yes. God was in each of those places. Finally, the questioning friend asked if the little boy was on a deserted desert island, would God be there? And again, without pausing, this child said, well, of course, because I'd be there, wouldn't I? That little boy understood the great fact that is pronounced like a trumpet call in the Bible's first book and first chapter, Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. 
in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It's as if the writers couldn't wait to share their amazing discovery. And just in case we didn't realize the import of it, they repeated it twice. It's like the image of the dog in the mirror that can't be separated from the actual dog in front of the mirror. It is this inseparability of God and man that gives you and me the confidence that God's healing presence is always here with us. Wherever we are as reflection, God must be there too. It's as if the writers of Genesis 1 were actually presenting a scientific textbook to humanity that would reach across the centuries, telling us that this is their premise and to please keep reading because, boy, oh boy, will they be able to prove this premise in case study after case study, what you and I call Bible stories. The scores of spiritual accounts of men, women, and children who follow that Genesis text in the Bible's remaining 65 books prove the inseparability of God and man over and over and over in every conceivable way, every near disaster, every seemingly impossible situation. And that is transformed into something inspiring for us. This parade of examples is the Bible's golden thread of healing, God's presence. Sometimes this divine presence came as a theophany, a word that simply means a revealing or a visible manifestation of God, such as the call to Abraham or through Moses in front of that burning bush, as this Russian painter tried to capture. Here are a few of these biblical figures going before us, marking our way, linking us through the centuries in this glorious line of light, as Mary Baker Eddy called it. In each case, they too faced evil's efforts to counterfeit the divine, and they worked through it, and so can we. So we're going to go through a few of these Bible figures and see how God's presence infused their lives. Who better to begin with than Noah? God's presence directed Noah to build an ark, told him when to enter it, when to leave it, who to take, and what to take. That divine presence provided every right action that ensured the safety of Noah and his family from a flood that could not destroy them, no matter how initially daunting it seemed. Abraham, God's presence impelled Abram to leave his native land of Ur and all the polytheistic worship so common there to find a new land where he could worship the one God to discover his covenantal relationship with God who would eventually provide both heirs and land. Likewise, we are compelled to leave behind today's gods of medicine, physiology, and hygiene as the only solutions to man's health. When danger and fear tries to reverse the quiet knowing of God's rescuing ever presence, we remember Lot and his family liberated from Sodom convinced that God's presence is always ready to rescue, deliver, sustain, and provide, regardless of how dangerous a situation appears. And remembering Lot's wife, we can see God's ever presence calling us forward, no longer looking back as if good was confined to the past and not the present and the future. God's presence of love and reconciliation lifted Jacob from overwhelming guilt about the wrongs he had done to his brother Esau, leading to the brother's full unification 
for themselves and their families. What a lesson to us for reversing the claims of regret or irreconcilable differences in our relationships. God's presence of wisdom placed Joseph in a remarkable role where he could bless not only his family, but an entire nation, even though his brothers had sold him to those Midianite merchant men as this beautiful painting shows. Joseph's willingness to bless his enemies and faithfully listen to God's direction later prevented starvation for many as well as his own family and united his family. What about Moses? And don't you love this Mark Chagall painting? God's presence unveiled a higher sense of law to the receptive Moses. The Ten Commandments would stabilize a people, a country, and eventually Western civilization itself for over 3,000 years, and they still are. How could we possibly think that God's law of health, of freedom, of protection, of rescue is not at work for us today? Joshua. God's presence carried the Hebrew people through 40 years in the wilderness, sustaining and guiding them to freedom, supplying the needed leadership of Moses and then his successor, Joshua, to keep them moving forward as they entered the promised land, claiming what God had already provided for them. How could we think whatever forward steps are needed in our lives we are not compelled to take because of that same loving divine presence. And then there's Deborah and her general. God's presence provided wisdom for judges like Deborah in Israel's early history, bringing direction to the tribes as they were settling in to their new land and ensuring inspired leadership when enemies were ready to attack, as Deborah and her general Barak experienced. That wisdom is as present today to receptive leaders and citizens in every nation on our earth, guiding them through the necessary legal, economic, and health decisions they need to make as they help us enter this recovering, reopening period. God's presence lovingly provided Hannah, the baby she had prayed for. Remember, Hannah was childless for so long, and she would go to pray to the priest there. And then this baby would grow up to be a prophet, a judge, and a priest, blessing Israel in remarkable ways. Samuel's receptivity to God's presence when he was called three times as a boy, remember that? And he responded. That loving presence guided him throughout a long career where he really became Israel's greatest religious and political leader during this period of the judges. And you recall, he eventually even anointed kings. David, God's presence guided Samuel to anoint an unlikely young shepherd as king who would have the very qualities Israel needed to unite the tribes politically, to help them be successful militarily, and the king that would write about half the hymns we have in our Hebrew scriptures hymnal called the Psalter or the Book of Psalms. In fact, as I was working on this talk, I thought a lot about Psalm 139, and I know this is one that you know very well, but think about how this psalm addresses the impossibility of ever being outside God's presence. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shoal or hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, 
even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. I suspect that is a psalm you have poured over as I have. Now think about the very first verse. Look at that pronoun that's used. O oh Lord, you have searched who? Me and known me. That leaves us with the startling conclusion that God knows both our actions and our thoughts. God knows you. Now, what Christian science does with this verse and with every verse in the Bible is unpacks it with scientific logic and reasoning. So I love this statement by Mrs. Eddy that really applies to this verse. All that really exists is the divine mind and its idea, and in this mind, the entire being is found harmonious and eternal. What an explanation that statement is for why we can never be separated from infinite God mind. Let's go back to some of our Bible figures. What about Solomon? God's presence imparted the wisdom that a young king named Solomon, David's son, needed to build not only the temple, but to lead his people, to expand his country, to oversee a generation of peace that was so important to Israel's development and to establish Israel's influence with other nations. And then there was the great prophet Elijah. God's presence fortified Elijah when he challenged Ahab and Jezebel's Baal prophets. And God's presence sustained him when those ravens gathered to feed him, when he was running for his life. And, and God's presence strengthened Elijah with that still small voice when he had reached his human limits of endurance. That loving divine presence even supplied a successor Elisha, seen here in this magnificent painting, as that chariot of fire carries Elijah away. And so, my friends, does our work continue, just as Elisha glimpsed Elijah's work must continue. When loved ones pass from our sight, don't we take up the mantle and carry on? I know many of you have been doing that this past year, and God bless everyone who has had to work through that challenge. These are just a few of the examples in the Hebrew scriptures. If we had time and we were all together in person, I'd ask you to come up with two or three more and share with your neighbor. But maybe you'll do that after this talk is over and really ponder the examples that you know that haven't been mentioned that are such vivid examples of this loving presence always with us. Christian science amplifies this sense of God's presence throughout the scriptures through the seven synonyms that Mrs. Eddy gave us through her definition of God as found in the Glossary of Science and Health. And here they are listed in the same order that she supplies them to us. And I suspect everyone on this call knows them well and has worked with them often. As we understand and apply these synonyms to our lives, having recognized their divine action on the lives of every biblical figure we encounter as we study the scriptures, these synonyms become like steps of a ladder enabling us to climb up and out of whatever is trying to pull us under, whatever is trying to counterfeit God's omnipresence, like this fear about contagion. So among many actions of each of these synonyms, think about how principles, presence, orders, mind's presence that governs, soul's presence that harmonizes, spirit's presence that directs, life's presence 
that ensures immortality, truth's presence that destroys error, and love's presence that casts out fear. We may identify different facets of God's presence in these Bible stories, but it is always there in some form, underscoring these as a type of contemporary case study that we can look to and learn from. You can be in no situation now or in the future where this divine presence is not meeting your need exactly at this moment, wherever you are and in whatever situation you find yourself in. Christ Jesus gives this divine presence a new name, Father, one of his favorite ways of conveying his closeness to God. You know, Father was a term that the Jewish people actually did not use for God. They used it for Abraham, their first patriarch. Remember, they would refer to him as Father Abraham. But Jesus is the one who really introduced the idea of God as our father. And there isn't a person around that can't appreciate what that means. Jesus taught his followers then and now that this one divine parent shepherds, guards, and protects us. This is the divine presence he taught us in the first line of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. It's also that divine presence of fatherhood that he talked of when declaring, I and my father are one in the book of John, at one with our divine source, as only an image can be. That's what you and I are. As we understand these powerful statements, they provide glimpses into how he was fortified during the many challenges and trials he faced and pointed to what sustains us in our current challenges. Christ Jesus' greatest example of unity with his Father and the greatest example humanity has ever been given is, of course, the resurrection. It overturned once and for all the assumption that life must end in death. Instead, Jesus proved that life continues right on and recall all those appearances he made to his followers and disciples, like the two men leaving Jerusalem, walking to Emmaus, to assure them that life was immortal. You know, the book of Revelation that closes the scriptures picks up this exact same uh, line of reasoning, but with a different image of Jesus. Instead, it's the slain lamb of Revelation. But recall, that slain lamb is victorious. And one of the wonderful things we see is that this risen Christ, this lamb, is fighting the beast's claim, the beast representing all of evil, that God and man can ever be separated. And of course, the entire Bible closes with a glimpse of the new heaven and the new earth when evil is gone and its aggressive claims once and for all. This is a wonderful and favorite cave painting of Paul. It's the earliest depiction known of him from a cave in Ephesus. Saul, prior to that Damascus Road conversion, thought he knew something about the divine presence. After all, he was head of his Hebrew school he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees in the book of Acts in chapter 23. It would take a blinding Damascus light to transform Paul's understanding from the law to grace. And that would begin a three decade ministry that would transform the Roman world to the point that it would not only include all those Gentiles, and take Christ's teachings beyond the Jews, but it would eventually transform the pagan Roman Empire into the holy Roman Empire as Christianity was adopted publicly. Paul has an amazing statement 
that is in um, Romans 6 that I love, that I think captures what he experienced and I think is at the heart of what happens when you and I uh, really feel this divine presence we're talking about. He writes to the Romans who he had never met, but he felt so close to. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism unto death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Paul was reborn. He was reborn because of this divine presence. And it didn't just happen on that Damascus road or he never could have survived what he faced. And it doesn't just happen to you and me once. It happens all the time. Every time we turn our thought, every time we yearn, every time we need to feel that supporting, loving, rescuing presence. This newness of life, which Paul explained, is the result of this golden thread throughout the scriptures, this presence. And regardless of what political, media, and health officials throw at the public, throw at you and me today, how can we possibly think this same divine presence is somehow not right here with us, lifting us up when we're at our lowest, bringing healing where there is pain, fear or disease, comforting those who mourn. I suspect every single person on this call could talk for probably hours about this divine presence at work in your own life. Isn't that remarkable? Each one of you are living witnesses to the scriptures. You know, I'm just going to deviate from my script for a second, and I hope Arden Wood forgives me if I go over for a second. But the fact is, when Luke wrote his second volume, the book of Acts, he didn't end it. And he was an amazing storyteller. He could have put a dashing, fabulous ending on, but it kind of dribbles out. And you realize it's because Acts is the biography of the church. And Luke knew the church will continue. And you and I are that church. Acts hasn't ended. Acts is being written with your life. That's the book of Acts today. The Acts of yielding to this divine presence. Isn't that thrilling? We continue to write the book of Acts with our lives. I want to return for just a moment to that original Genesis verse that I suspect every single person on this call treasures and is the real foundation of our understanding of God about man made in God's image. That is the spiritual fact that guarantees God's presence wherever you are, just like that little boy in the story understood. But did you ever wonder who wrote this? How did they come up with this? And in preparing this talk, I have to confess, I have used that verse and leaned on it all my life. And in the last two months is the first time I began to really think about the men and maybe women who wrote Genesis 1 and what their lives were like. And I want to just talk about that for a minute because it's so relevant to you and me today. I have such respect for these writers. They are called the priestly writers because they had to prove the inspiration they were writing. Isn't that something you and I have had to learn? What is lasting and really true in our lives comes through inspiration. And then we get the opportunity to prove it, just as our leader, Mary Baker Eddy, did. She had to not only be inspired to write science and health and all of her other writings and poetry, etc. She had to prove every single word of them. And when you and I know her life experience through the many biographies about her, don't you find that you read a sentence and you can almost see, oh, wow, that probably came out of a lawsuit or that sentence probably came out of a dissident student that she had to learn to love, or maybe that statement came out of her prayers for founding the church or the Christian Science Monitor 
or closing the metaphysical college, whatever it was, those sentences in Science and Health are not just inspirational, they're autobiographical. And the same is true for you and me. What we see, we have to prove. The priestly writers that gave us Genesis 1 are no different. Think what they had to prove in a foreign land, how God's loving presence was still with them. You see, these people were in the heart of the Babylonian exile that happened around the late 500s BC. That's who gave us Genesis 1. Think what their lives were like. They were uh, trying to be, uh, they were having forced on them uh, a new religion, new clothing, new language, new names, everything. And we know that through the Daniel stories, don't we? So what's remarkable to me is that they began to glimpse that God's presence was not in Israel. It wasn't confined to the temple. They so dearly loved. God's presence was actually with them in Babylon. And although the priestly writers wrote several hundred years after earlier Genesis writers, like the writers of the bulk of Genesis 2 and beyond, the priestly writers put their account in first. Do you see what I'm saying? They acted as the final editors. And so they said, we're going to put our account ahead of this older one. That's pretty amazing when you think of it. Well, why did they do that? Because they understood that what they glimpsed about man made in the image and likeness of God literally meant their survival. And it was their gift to all of us for several thousand years and has continued to be our gift. It's as if those priestly writers who had learned so much during the exile were literally saying to us, we're going to give you two very different creation accounts. You decide through your life which one is accurate. And that is exactly the challenge Mary Baker Eddy took up. Remember, she wrote 700 pages on the book of Genesis alone before she ever wrote Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And eventually she would write of these two accounts and put it in her primary work, Science and Health. If one is true, the other is false, for they are antagonistic. You know, I went to the seminary and got a graduate degree in theology with a focus on biblical studies. And I can tell you in that one sentence, which is not many words, I think under 10 words, she just overturned about 2,000 years of scholastic theology. It just is astonishing to me. So how did these priestly writers come to this profoundly different conclusion that spirit is the creator and man is made in spirit's likeness? How did they come to see that God and man are so inseparable that man is the image or very expression of God? Because they had to. They had to learn it in very challenging conditions of enslavement, of forced re-education, and everything else that was involved in their uh, slavery period. That is the demand on us to lean more, to trust more, to understand more of this foundational truth that was really earned through their lives and is earned and learned through ours. And this brings us to the second point of our giraffe story, that sometimes the most jarring of experiences, the equivalent of that baby falling six feet to break that umbilical cord, those are exactly the experiences that most provide our spiritual growth. You probably read about the quantum leap that has been tracked on the internet for uh, searches like spirituality, God, prayer, through this past year of COVID shutdown, people are searching and they are looking. The Jewish people made tremendous spiritual strides during their captivity. Before the exile, the temple was all important to them. That's where God lived. After the exile, it was the word because they knew God was everywhere. Where they were, God's presence was. During the exile, 
the Jews realized God wasn't confined to the temple as they were experiencing firsthand the divine presence by the waters of Babylon in king's courts, in lion's dens. And they wrote down this new understanding of God, resulting in many of the scriptures that constitute the Old Testament you and I read every day. What a debt we owe to these people and what an example they have set for us to pay forward our glimpses into God's ever presence, our understanding of our inseparability from God for future generations from us. A marvelous example of this turning to God that they must have gone through and shared with us are the back-to-back Psalms of Psalm 137 and 138. They're remarkable. And you can substitute in whatever challenge you faced or the world is facing collectively, like this uh, pandemic, to the words of this lament. So I've taken the liberty to do just that because we don't have time for you to pause and maybe write it down. So I hope you'll bear with me as we kind of look at a rewrite. By the rivers of Babylon, the psalmist wrote, or the news of a pandemic. There we sat down and there we wept, felt isolated, sad, and frightened. When we remembered Zion, the life before the pandemic, how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land in the midst of a global health challenge? The Jews who wrote this psalm were spiritual pioneers and they never stopped with the darkness, understanding that the way out of that darkness is to express gratitude for this omnipresent love of God. So we go to Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart before the gods of medicine or hygiene, you might say. I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything we could call health laws, statistics, news reports. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. When they returned to their homeland of Judah, these priests wrote down what they learned, and that became our Genesis 1. They realized that God and man are so close that the only image they could think of was a mirror, which mirrors were around from about 4000 BC. This is an example of a a Roman mirror from about the first century BC. They would have seen such mirrors, especially in Babylonian captivity, because the Babylonians were quite a sophisticated materially oriented culture that would have had a lot of things like mirrors. But for these inspired thinkers to make the leap from God as some physical manifestation that the Babylonians believed in to a God you couldn't see, which they had understood of their God in the temple, to a God you couldn't see who was ever present and man is the image or expression of That is extraordinary. Somehow, I just want to pause and say the deepest thanks to these spiritual thinkers for working through all the challenges of their lives and coming to this. They glimpsed the simple but profound fact that where they are, God is. Where you are, God is. And we are the beneficiaries of that. We've each, no doubt, experienced the equivalent of being dropped six feet on the ground um, to break whatever ties we had. And I've had an experience recently I want to share with you. Um, About six months ago, my very beloved husband passed away suddenly And we live near the beach, and I always walk on the beach. And about two mornings after that, I was really uh, 
feeling like I was drowning and I was reaching out on my mental knees. And um, it wasn't a second before this word came to me, masterclass. And on the heels of that, masterclass on immortality. And that's when I realized that's exactly where he was. He was in his own masterclass on immortality. He was going on, moving forward and doing it with great joy. This was a man who had dedicated his whole life to learning about God and to helping others learn about God. How could I possibly think that was over? And that buoyed me beyond what I could say. But on the heels of that, and what was kind of astonishing for me was a phrase came for me, which was that I was in a master class on love. And he was a great example to me of love. And I knew I had a lot to learn about love. And I remember walking away uh, back to the house early that morning thinking I had just been spiritually resuscitated. It felt that profound as a change and it has stayed with me. Now, since that morning, I'm not going to tell you that suddenly everything was hunky dory and smooth sailing because it has not been. And uh, that would be deceptive to indicate. But what I can say is that when we get these divine messages from our loving, tender father, mother, uh, they don't just sit on a shelf. They have to be proved. And I have had multiple opportunities to learn more about love. And while some of them haven't been easy, uh, they don't leave you where they find you. And I know there's not a person on this call who doesn't know what I'm talking to from your own experience. So isn't that what you and I signed up for? Spiritual maturing. If you didn't, you wouldn't be attending this annual meeting of Arden Wood. So we celebrate a year, not only of this beautiful institution's healing victories, but of our own. Whatever baby giraffe experience has caused you to wake up this year, even if it has been jarring, is the very one that we can be most grateful for. It means we're a little clearer about the absolute truth of Genesis 1, a little more sure that nothing can separate us from this loving presence of our Father, Mother, God, a bit more sure-footed spiritually, less thrown by the winds that would try to blow us off course. And this is spiritual growth. And like our young giraffe, it enables us to move even more freely in our world. So we're coming to a close. We've talked about these three points. I hope each one has resonated with you. God's loving, tender, ever presence, the jarring moments that actually precipitate spiritual growth, and that parade of biblical figures that teach us over and over in our own lives how we can make decisions based on God's ever presence. So with a heart full of gratitude, I hope you all join me and think about Psalm 61. I'll be the poet who sings your glory and live what I sing every day. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, Arden Wood. Thank you, Maddie. As we all know, there are many themes in the Bible, but the healing, the ever presence of God is most definitely the golden thread throughout, isn't it? Tomorrow, Maddie's slides will be an email to all the registrants along with a link to the replay of this entire meeting. Thank you one and all for attending our 2021 annual meeting and for your support of all our services and events. We hope you'll save the date and join us again on Sunday afternoon, September 19th for our first hybrid event since early last year. And it's a world premiere. And finally, how much we look forward to welcoming you back inside Arden Wood as soon as we can. Please check our website for reopening details and to learn about upcoming events. 
Thank you and goodbye for now.